Oh, hello. It's just um, polishing one of my teapots here for the uh, 2021 Renderman Art and Science Fair. Welcome. Today we're going to be talking about, of all things, Renderman, and I will be showing you um, a couple new interesting things with XPU and the entire features of the renderer. Let me bring up my keynote here. And um, I see that the, the chat box is literally exploding in a figurative way. And um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dylan Sisson. I work in the Renderman group at Pixar, have done that since 1999. And uh, I'm a digital artist. I'm the creator of The Walking Teapot. Um, for those of you who do know me, I need no introduction. Um, today we have uh, a kickoff for the entire Art and Science Fair. So we have our keynote, includes me, um, Julian Fong, David Ryu, our VP of Renderman, Oliver Meisenberg, CTO of Pixar, Steve May, and the um, great Rob PK with another stupid Renderman trick, which... Um, is um, extra stupid this year. And we have lots of good stuff coming in the agenda. Check it out. We even have a Pete panel with Pete Doctor at two today. And, um, you know, it's been a while since our, since our last uh, Art and Science Fair. So you, um, you might be wondering, well, what's new? Um, and I'm glad you asked because that's uh, the title of my next slide, what's new. We have Redman 24, we released that at the end of June on the 29th, and it has some great stuff in it uh, that we'll be getting to. We just released 24.1, which has some even um, some, some neat additions to uh, 24, and uh, that was released just last week, I think just last, uh, um, on the 30th. And it's August 3rd. You are here at the Renderman Science Fair. It's uh, actually happening. And um, uh, it's, been, it's been an interesting year, uh, obviously. Um, but finally, we have XBU. XBU is here, combines the GPU and the CPU together. Uh, you put all your PUs together, you get XPU. And we thought it would be fun to show you XPU in action. And what better way to show XPU in action than with the reveal of the walking teapot for 2021. This new model is um, probably our most avant-garde model that we've ever uh, released. Um, maybe suitable for the Museum of Modern Art. So I have a, a little demo that I want to show you with some um, interactive um, action so you can really get a feel of XPU. So let me bring that up. This year's model Hold on. is inside this box. We're going to take a look at it with an interactive IPR live rendering session XPU. Let's take a look. Okay. There it is. What do you think? Might not look like much, but it's got it where it counts. I've added a some special modifications myself, but I can make it more interesting with a couple parameter tweaks here. Uh, first, let me change the color a little bit. Let's see. Oh, that was quick. And it looks like there's apparently some kind of gearbox inside this teapot. Interesting. Let's see. We can kind of smidge the refraction color a little bit, and then why don't we tweak the index of refraction? Uh, from from 1 to 1 1.1, 1.2, 1 and maybe 1.46, the index of refraction of plastic. Let's take a look at that. Now, that looks like a nice teapot, uh, fully mechanical. Um, seems like you could almost print this out in 3D and have it actually walk around. That's cool. But before we get to talking about the teapot, let's uh, kick the tires in XPU. Take a... Uh, a closer look, if you will, at the um, 
at XPU and what's going on with this teapot. There's really a lot of geometry here, a lot of gears. And for those rays to get all the way through, uh, we need a ray depth of over 24. So there's a lot of ray tracing that's happening in this image, and it's converging quite quickly. And that's really the whole point of XPU. Um, I'm moving the camera here. Um, so we have a top view of the teapot. It converges uh, quickly as well and kind of take a take a back view as well. Um, there's a teapot and XP is kind of like a Formula One race car. Like it's really good at, at driving on the right kind of track. Um, and if it's a workflow that involves work, look development or layout, it performs really, really well. In this case, um, adding a, a simple fabric shader from the preset browser and then another one, um, a granite to the teapot. And you can see that it's updating really fast. And this is the whole idea behind XPU. And um, now we're opening up the guts, taking a look at the teapot, turning on some lights, turning off some lights, and really experiencing a kind of fluid workflow. We're not having to wait a lot um, to see our results. We see our results as we make the changes, which is great. So you might ask, um, how does it compare to, to RAS? RAS is already a fast uh, modern pa path tracer. Well, fortunately, I have a head-to-head -head battle here. And it's kind of a workflow battle. So the, the, um, it's kind of a, well, let me show you. I have, I have the machine specs on the bottom, but let's just take a look. XPU is on the top, RES is on the bottom, and we have a battle. We can start it right now and go. All right. Let's see who, whose pixels come in first. That's RES, takes the early lead, and, uh, oh, XPU is already done. So XPU takes, takes a little time um, loading things into memory, and then, it's, and then it's off to the races. It's, uh, in this particular workflow, I'm just kind of going through the same motions with each of them, waiting uh, for each image to converge to kind of a time-to-first decision. Um, and you can see that XPU is much faster. So the goal of XPU is to provide artists an environment where they don't have to bake or cache uh, any data. They can press render and start getting really fast fluid feedback in this first early phase for look development. So um, I'm adding another shader to the teapot on top in XPU. On bottom, RES is still um, trying to iterate on, on the gears with the um, 24 depth, uh, ray depth. And um, the gold looks nice. And we'll add another texture. And you can see how fast those uh, shaders actually converge. Uh, when you move the camera or attach them to the object, they actually converge faster than it takes to load them in from the, the preset browser. So it's um, pretty quick. And the teapot's looking looking pretty good and we've already gone through a couple iterations of looking at a kind of a full-blown shader on the teapot for XPU and have been enjoying a workflow that doesn't have these arbitrary limitations where you're just waiting for the pixels to come in in this case you can try out however many you know shaders or materials you want on an object and get feedback almost uh, almost immediately so it's a it's a very nice workflow and um, if you want to see XPU show off well there's the walking teapot walking in XPU at 1k on um, in a live rendering session and RES is still playing catch up and I should emphasize that XPU and RES work together RES is still a great renderer XPU allows us to do look development get things looking great, and then send that later in the uh, pipeline to RES for a final frame render. There's also more in 24. One of the big ones is Material X Llama. That's a big highlight. I don't know what you think of when you hear Llama, but it's not this. 
It's Material X Llama. It was developed at ILM for their feature films. They will be participating in a panel with our team at 12 p.m. today at high noon. So uh, you'll want to check that out. It's a system for layering together materials. So it's a node-based lobe system where the approach is, unlike an Uber shader, which has all the parameters in it, you can assemble your shading models yourself in this um, in a Llama network. And that provides a lot of flexibility and efficiency as well. A cool thing that happened in 24.1 is that we have an update to RenderMan for Substance Painter. Here is a painter, Substance Painter, and here is the new RenderMan plugin. We have the preset browser inside of Painter. I can attach a shader and I can export that shader directly to my a preset browser, which I'm doing right now. I'm changing the name to Red Machine, and I'm going to select a shading model. I can select a Pixar Surface a print Disney Principal Shader or now a Llama Network. And I can also uh, choose color, color management as well. If I export it, it's going to appear inside my preset browser, and then I can load that up in my favorite DCC. So I can point my DCCs at the same custom library, and it's just that simple. So here I am in Maya, and I have my, my Llama folder, and it has my red machine shader in it. And I'll import that and attach it to my teapot, and voila. I've got my shader there. And I also have my live statistics running, so I thought that'd be kind of fun to show you just the live statistics in action. And down below, you can see the Llama shading network. So this isn't just a, a big Uber shader, but it's actually, that's the Llama network that has all the different clear coats, specular, diffuse, and displacement all combined together, output directly from the new updated Rain Man for Substance Painter plugin, uh, which is pretty exciting. Stylized Looks is another uh, interesting development in 24. So we have interactive photo surrealism. Let me just give you a look at it. Here I have the start of my look. I have a little bit of a kind of hatch going on, and I'm going to add some lines to it. Uh, these are all done in the display filter, and essentially what I have is a live drawing. I'm using it, our image tool, to visualize it because I can also go in and check out all the AOVs that you see on the left-hand side there. I'm adding some more lines, and it's really a, another case where we have interactivity uh, showing just how much you benefit as an artist being able to see things update while you're doing them. So here we'll zoom in, blow out the teapot a little bit, Usually I say no teapots were harmed during the making of the talks. This one is different. So that looks pretty good. And let's just make it pop with a, a little bit of a, of a white. So add a little white, make that pop. Looks pretty good. It's, um, it's fun to work with these um, live drawings. Here is kind of the inspiration for that particular look. Uh, these are based on my own drawings I did for um, Inktober last year. And four of these drawings are actually rendered with Random Man stylized looks. They're not drawings, they're actually 3D models that were rendered. Can you guess which ones are which? Uh, you'll have to tune in to my talk at 1 p.m. and uh, find out. And yet there's even more in Random Man 24. We have Random Man for Blender, now supporting 2.93 in 24.1. We have support for ACEs, so we have nice color management workflows. Bump roughness is new, rolled out on Cars 3. It's now in the shipping product. We have new patterns, phaser noise uh, for stunning images and hex tiling, unified bump maps, a whole, whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we're supporting Maya 2022. We have Python 3 for Houdini 18.5. Uh, NCR non-commercial render man is out and available and uh, my favorite feature ETC oh I almost forgot the teapots we have an AR contest so let's check this out 
So we have an actual AR teapot that you can download using this URL on the bottom of the screen and bring your teapot into your living environment. We're going to have a contest. Uh, you can post these images on Instagram and you can be judged by us. Uh, you must use the hashtags Random Man and Walking Teapot and the uh, entry, the posting that is judged the best by our panel of judges will win three commercial licenses of Random Man, Katana license, a one production collective license from the Foundry, and from Side Effects, one Houdini FX license. So kind of a fun thing and um, uh, totally overpowered prizes for this. And he walks. We also have a new Render Man art challenge coming. The next official Render Man challenge is uh, going to be great. It's uh, We're teaming up with Adobe and doing some fun stuff with the Substance plugin in Material X Llama. And it's a good excuse to, to try a non-commercial Render Man because it's not going to try itself. And thank you. Um, that is our summary for what's new in RenderMan. And next on stage to talk about some of the cool technology that was developed for Luca to render things like these shadow fringes is Julian Fong and David Ryu. All right. Uh, thanks, Dylan. Um... So yeah, <clears throat> I'm David Ryu. I was a visual effects supervisor on Luca. Um, I'm going to be presenting with Julian Fong, who's a uh, principal software engineer in RenderMan. And we're just going to talk about um, a cool kind of joint RenderMan uh, Luca project. And you know, I pre-recorded myself to um, just uh, uh, make this a little easier. So let me get that started. I'm David Ryu. I was visual Hi. effects supervisor. I'm David Ryu. I was visual effects. I'm going to be presenting with Julian Fong, who is a principal software engineer on the RenderMan team. And we're going to be talking about some just really amazing work in RenderMan that we used on the show for something called Shadow Fringe. So one of the special things about making movies at Pixar is that if you're presented with some crazy challenge and you don't know what to do, uh, you can pick up the phone and get the amazing expertise of the RenderMan team to you know, work with the show and find a way to make it happen. So on Coco, the RenderMan engineers jumped in and made RenderMan able to scale up to millions of lights so we could achieve this vision of this amazing, vibrant world of the dead. And on Finding Dora, we had all this water and RenderMan took a huge leap with RAS and path tracing um, just to make all that water really sing. On Luca, our director had goals for the look. You know, he comes from a traditional art background and wanted to infuse some of that feeling into the look of the show. And it was another opportunity to work with fine folks like Julian. Um, so let me just take a sec and give some background on the looks goals we were going after. So, you know, we wanted color everywhere, bold colors, lots of saturation above water and underwater. We wanted just simple kind of elegant forms uh, in the characters here, but also like, you know, looking for places to put it like, you know, you see the shapes of the water reflections. We really wanted to kind of simplify those and make, make those, you know, beautiful. And we wanted just texture, beautiful, rich texture all over the frame. Um, you know, if you look at the stone wall here, you know, texture that wasn't realistic, um, you know, with a really great interplay with color. Um, so we were just like always looking for ways to inject a kind of painterly brushy texture. I love the wall of Massimo's kitchen, just like this kind of beautiful interpretation of plaster here. Um, and, you know, we wanted to put texture into things that normally don't have texture, like these lens flares. Um, there's this kind of subtle brush strokey grain uh, in, in those that I think are, uh, really add something to the image. And, you know, all of these things we pushed to 11 in the dream sequences. We went hard on, you know, brush stroke textures in the sky. Um, and, you know, the glow around the moonfish here, you know, as an example, we wanted to kind of get texture in there. So it's driven by a painting. Um, 
painting um, to just kind of give it that nice toothiness. So we were basically just like looking for opportunities to kind of add color and texture. One of the places that Enrico really wanted to add this uh, was in shadows. And this is inspired by illustrations uh, by an artist named Tadahiro Yusugi. Uh, you see the shadows have these edges that have light leaking into them that really kind of give this beautiful hit of color um, and this kind of nice texture. Um, and in addition to just being this beautiful kind of illustrative touch, it really does add a feeling of heat and light and summer, which is kind of lots of, you know, what we were going after in the film. So we've done, you know, colored shadow edges before. This is way back on Ratatouille. Uh, the hard part is adding the texture and especially kind of, you know, in a path tracer, shadows aren't really like a thing, you know, it's just a, something that happens when you know, there's a blocker between you and a light. So it's not obvious how to control it. It's not obvious how to kind of um, insert color texture into specific places. So, you know, we picked up the phone and called our friends on the RenderMan team to help us out. And with that, I'll pass off to Julian. Thanks, David. Um... My name is Julian Fong, and I'm a principal software engineer uh, working the RenderMan group since 1999. I'm just going to pull up my slides while we're talking here. All right, so I'm going to present some of the work we did for Luca and Soul as a case study in how over the last 30 plus years, Pixar's pushing of artistic boundaries on its films continually drives technology innovation in RenderMan. When we got the call from Luca to help with some of their look dev requests around lighting and shadowing, it actually tied in nicely with some ongoing thinking that had arose from an exploration of non-photorealistic lighting back in our previous film, Soul. So my talk today is called Post-Lighting Shading, and it arises from looking at the direct lighting pipeline in RenderMan RIS. As part of the standard path tracing framework, this pipeline runs BXDF or light sample generation. Evaluates those samples, traces shadows, and runs light filters. Light filters are these really cool things that allow you to alter the lighting independently of the lights themselves. And Pixar's lighters relies on them very heavily. Most of these stages have limited inputs and outputs. And at the very end, we simply multiply all the terms together and write the product to the frame buffer. So what if we introduced a new stage that had read access to all the terms, as well as geometric properties, and could read and write to them? Uh, more explicitly, given the BXDF terms, the light terms, the shadow rays, and the transmittance, what interesting things can we do in a fairly arbitrary post-lighting shader? So this initial exploration started off as a look dev driven collaboration of soul, characters, and lighting. Steve Pilcher, the production designer, and Ian McGibbon, the DP for lighting, created these paint overs of Joe in the limbo sequence. Ian and Ryan Machuro, the lighting lead for the soul world, pointed out that there's a colored shadow aspect to this look that is strongly driven by the directionality of the lighting, but also needed to be art directable. Mitch Kopelman and I came up with the notion that we could hit some of this look by tweaking the response of the volume to its own self-shadowing in a non-physical manner, either by remapping the transmittance to some other values entirely or by having the albedo of the volume respond to the, to the transmittance in some very non-physical form. So that led to the notion of a shadow tint post-lighting shader. Uh, here's the heart of the C++ code that I wrote for it, and I promise this is the only code that I'll show today. It's very straightforward, just a bunch of linear mixes and HSV conversions. But the real takeaway here is that this code has unfettered access to the transmittance values from the shadow rays and the BXDF weights, and can read and write to both of them. If you come from a really old school RSL background, this isn't exactly novel, but RIS being a physically based path tracer with plugins wasn't initially designed for this, and it's interesting to start putting this ability to do anything back into our artistic toolbox. So how does this code translate to pictures? Well, given the volumetric transmittance that came from the shadow rays, we can now remap those transmittance values entirely to completely different shadow colors 
on the top row, I remapped low and high shadowing to different points on a color map. Or we can use those transmittances to increase the saturation of the underlying albedo response. So instead of the um, volume self-shadowing getting darker on the bottom row, the volume self-shadows and gets more and more saturated and more colorful. Uh, we can shift the albedo response in an entirely different direction. On the top row, when Joe is deeper in shadow, his volume's albedo actually mixes in an entirely different color. And then we need controls for self-shadowing, which is actually very important, but involves a lot of scaffolding about how to shoot extra shadow rays for substance that I won't talk about today. But on the images below, the effect of the albedo hue shift ignores the shadowing cast by the sphere and the effect is restricted to Joe Shadow Age himself. Uh, this post-lighting stage was embedded in the volumetric shader, this parameter set up by George Nguyen on the Astro characters. So this is a frame of Sol Joe in the limbo sequence without the shadow tint shading. The albedo color is driven by an iridescence driver developed by Jun Yi Ling, driven in part by a user-defined color wrap. Notice here that the lighting response is quite dark because of the density of the volume. If you were to try to change the density of the scattering anisotropy instead to hit the desired look in the initial paint overs, it's quite hard to control. With the shadow hint controls enabled, the hue controls, the accumulated volumetric transmittance is remapped to darker versions of values derived from the upstream iridescence driver. So this helps hit the desired look while still retaining the critical visual cue that the illumination changes as we get deeper into the volume. We can now give a boost to the underlying saturation using the shadow tint for the final rendered result before comp. Notice that it significantly boosts the deep blue color of the back of Joe's head, that's before and after, where before we're simply just completely in shadow. Uh, here's the final frame with the haloing elements and our post-production filters. The final look is a bit different because of an important haloing component layered on top of the characters that uh, they call the ethereal helmet. Ryan Mitchell has talked about the overall character development elsewhere, and if you're interested in finding out more about that work, I encourage you to find those talks online. So for Luca, we started thinking about using this post-lighting shading toolbox in a very different way. Uh, David Rio just talked about showing us these uh, references, and Kim White, the DP, and Amy Jones, a lighting visual development lead, uh, they were all interested in exploring some non-physical shadowing looks for this film, and, and um, these paintings have a very interesting painterly shadow look, particularly in the penumbra regions. So if you look in the shadow detail, what would normally be a soft penumbra transition instead has a detailed sharp edge with textured brushwork in the transition region. So what we came up with is extending this idea that we had of a post-lighting shader and literally taking it in a brand new direction. So given the original shadow ray direction picked by light sample generation, instead of using that single transmittance values, we use that shadow ray as a guide and instead shoot a whole bunch more rays in a cone around that shadow ray and average the transmission results. If you're familiar with how we compute occlusion using ray tracing, and um, this is nothing new, but what's different here is that we're gonna now try to create an artificial penumbra region with an associated zero one occlusion value. Uh, I am glossing over a lot of details about how we attempted to deal with creating a useful artistic control over the sides of the penumbra region by accounting for the distance to the nearest blocker, the distance to the light, um, the shadow receiving geometry being angled away from the light. There were some complications that we couldn't fully solve about reacting to the shape of the casting geometry itself, but in the end, the ability to generate these artificial penumbra regions seemed like a really powerful tool towards hitting the desired fringe look. So I put all this shadow tracing code into a new stage that runs in a light filter called Shadow Fringe. And if you attach to this light filter in a small distant light, you can get a zero to one occlusion ramp that you can trivially remap to colors. So here, we're already wandering away from physically base lighting and into non-physical shadows. These shadows should be black, and instead they're a color ramp from blue to red. So at this point, because I recognized that for the film, they weren't able to hit the look they wanted for simple mixes and ramps, i.e. things that could comfortably code in a small C++ shader, 
I added support for OSL shading to operators' inputs to light filters, which is something we hadn't considered before. Created an output from the shadow fringe light filter that encoded this artificial penumbra function as a built-in value. And then passed the problem on to Joachim de Deacon, one of the technical lighting leads, who also handled the RFK integration for this feature. So he put together these wonderful OSL pattern networks that uses penumbra signal in interesting ways to start hitting the so-called Tadahiro fringe effect. So to start off with, you can threshold the input signal to create a low, medium, high subrange of the penumbra. Basically split the signal into different regions. Then you can take one of these split regions and apply a texture map signal to add some texture to the shadow region. Uh, if you combine two of these filters bound to the same light or make two lights where one of them has a different color and a softer, warm transition, you start getting this look, which starts hitting some of the desired characteristics. Or you can push that idea even further and go towards an almost fully watercolor-like shadow effect. Uh, on this one, you can actually see some additional tweaks that were enabled to have the two penumbra regions cast by the two balls be comparable in size, even though one is being cast by a ball much further away. And obviously, at this point, the shadowing has no basis in reality, although the other characteristics of the lighting itself is still fully physical. And there's no additional geometry that was added to the scene to make this picture. So here's how some of this looked in the actual film as deployed by Bert Pang, uh, one of the lighting sets leads. This frame of Luca is rendered here without shadow fringe. The final setup of shadow fringe involves multiple distant lights with different cone sizes. So you're seeing some of the effect of that here. Uh, when, when you enable the shadow fringe on the light, you can see the Tadahiro inspired fringe effect. So before after. It's more subtle than in the painted reference, but you can see the important details of a sharp outer edge with some inner textured complexity. I'll show some more in a, at the end of this. Um, other things we're investigated or considering? Uh, cheat shadows. We want to be able to selectively tweak some shadows without relighting the whole scene. So say you have a character who's wearing a hat. And you get a note to the effect that the shadow of the hat on the face needs to be moved in order to read the character better, but none of the lighting should be changed. This is not an imaginary scenario. It's an actual thing that's happened during production at Pixar. So cheat shadow is this idea that you can adjust a manipulator and bend the shadow rays around a particular group of casters like the hat without changing the rest of the lighting in order to hit that note. We've had some versions of this in-house on and off in various forms, but moving this to a first-class light filter actually makes it much easier to deploy and maintain. Uh, Shadow-driven shading on some upcoming films. We've been doing some exploration of extending to hard surfaces, the idea of alternating the saturation or BXDR response, depending on the shadow. Again, some of this is already embedded in some in-house tech, but formalizing it as a post-lighting stage in a light filter gives us additional flexibility. Uh, volumetric characters. We've told interesting stories with volumetric characters, notably in Partly Cloudy and Soul, and there'll be more to come. Volumetric characters are challenging to light and challenging to read as characters, so we're always looking for better ways to shape them. Uh, this post-lighting shading is a step towards an interesting idea, which is non-physical lighting in a physically-based renderer. We want to remain firmly within a wider PBR framework while still being open to some minor rule bending that can deliver a large payoff in terms of helping our artists hit interesting ideas. I'm sure there's a lot more that can be done in this area, so please send us your ideas. Um, as I said, this stuff is still being actively worked on, but some of it will likely reach you in future releases, perhaps as early as PRMN 25. So please consider this a sneak peek of some fun things to come. Uh, that about wraps up my talk. Uh, nothing we do in film production is ever just the work of one person or one group. And it took everyone here many, many hours to help drive, deploy, and support this work. So I want to give a huge, huge thank you to all of them, as well as the Soul and Luca film crews for pushing new looks for Frenderman. And I'm going to show a video clip uh, showing some final frames of everything I just talked about here. And I apologize for this delay because I'm a little slow with this. Here we go.
All right, thank you for listening. Uh, now it's my pleasure to bring on stage Oliver Meisberg, the Vice President of RenderMan at Pixar, who will talk about some future directions of RenderMan and XPU. All right, thank you, Julian and David. That was an inspiring presentation. Uh, while I bring up my presentations, I wanna share a few things. So first of all, you've seen greatly how uh, production um, inspires RenderMan development and also how RenderMan also inspires production by pushing the technical boundaries of what you can do. Um, and as Dylan mentioned in his presentation, we have a bunch of production technologies such as bump to roughness coming out of cars production uh, and phaser noise, which was heavily used at ILM for creating a lot of environments, especially desert environments, um, coming back to render man. And there's more to come in the future as well. As Julian mentioned, we're happy to also receive a ton of feedback around the ideas that we're just starting to develop, like the Shadow Fringe, uh, as we'll definitely hit some of our future releases. Um, before I jump into my presentation, I also, also want to thank everyone participating today. I just pulled some statistics, and it's incredible to see uh, people from 78 countries participating in our event. That's huge. That's really mind-blowing. And, and thanks to everyone who stays up late or wakes up super early to participate in this event. Uh, we thank you for that. So yeah, uh, my name is Oliver. I'm the vice president for the RenderMan Group, and uh, I will give you a brief overview of where RenderMan is today, what happened also beyond the RenderMan release in uh, the last year. Um, there was a lot of stuff happening, um, and I'm happy to share it with you right now. So as all of you know, we Renderman goes all the way back 1988. It was a long time, um, and we made tremendous progress since then. So there's been multiple different renderers, and uh, with Renderman XPU, we hit another milestone. But all of this is, is only possible with a team of the most awesome engineers uh, on the planet, and I'm really happy to have this awesome team around me to help making Renderman the best renderer that you can use in production. Um, Talking about history, if you look at the history of RenderMan, we've been through the fourth major rewrite of RenderMan. So starting with a raise algorithm all the way back in 1988, um, switching to a hybrid model before we uh, switched to ray tracing, which is still active in the RIS framework um, today. And then uh, we added XPU uh, on top of this with the goal to uh, have XPU replace RIS in the long run. Um, XP is heavily involved in Pixar production uh, and beyond. We're also working with a bunch of studios in the industry who took on XPU uh, and uh, help us developing it further and further, which is very exciting. But even beyond the main um, random and development, there has been a lot of things that, that was accomplished by the team as well to help everyone in the industry to um, get you into random man, help you understand and learn random man, um, and we're happy to share some of that as well today. So um, as Dylan mentioned, we just released RenderMan 24.1 uh, a week ago, um, and we're still working on 24. updates uh, moving forward. So there will be more to come very soon as well. Uh, and the team's also working heavily on RenderMan 25. Um, a major change uh, that's common towards RenderMan is we will switch to an annual release cycle. So right now, RenderMan has been on a more fluid release cycle, uh, as we were also heavily driven by production. But as things align more and more, it, it's easier for us to um, switch to an annual cycle. So it's uh, more frequent development. You get uh, updates much faster. Uh, and we can also progress faster as a studio, which is fantastic. And we're expanding our ecosystem. Uh, as Dylan mentioned, uh, Blender uh, became part of our family. Uh, and then also the Substance Painter plugin has been updated. Um, and we're happy to also add, this, uh, add these bridges to our ecosystem. We're very excited about uh, our longstanding partners, Houdini, uh, Katana, Maya, to keep supporting them and, and pushing the limits even further. But also adding Blender means a lot of new inspiration to our team. There's a great community out there, a lot of Blender artists that we are super excited about to work with uh, to shape RenderMan in an even better way. And then the Substance plugin, you will find out more tomorrow in the Art and Science Fair uh, Art Challenge presentation um, that we share with Adobe to find out what this is all about. And then we have Arvid Schneider also giving a little bit of a presentation there, which is very exciting. So uh, if you haven't subscribed to that, do it now. 
Um, last year in November, uh, we launched the new Renderman Fundamentals Initiative um, that's developed by Eugene Rojansky. And he did an amazing job to develop a complete new Renderman uh, course uh, from start to finish. So this course covers everything in Renderman from shaders, lights, render settings, some tips and tricks, uh, and best practices from the industry. And the Renderman Fundamentals course covers 23 and 24. So it will be easy for people who still on 23 to adjust to their pipeline and, and workflows and understand if they want to learn more. And then uh, Renderman 24, um, if you want to learn all about XPU, Llama, uh, phaser noise, um, this training course is also for you. The good news is also, there's a Blender Kickstarter um, that we just put out a, a few weeks ago uh, to help the Blender community on board with Renderman understand how to use the renderer inside their application uh, because every workflow is slightly different. And so this is dedicated to the Blender community and it's uh, really incredible. So let me share a quick picture of this. So uh, it's about look development. Uh, we picked a fairly complex robot from one of our previous art challenges. Um, and we guide you through the whole process. The entire training is free. So if you want to um, check it out, go to the Renderman website and check it out today. Um, again, it is completely free. It remains free. Um, so check, go check it out. Um, a few weeks ago, we also launched finally uh, a YouTube channel. Um, people told us it's a thing, so we said, okay, we don't miss out on that one. Um, and we created a new YouTube channel. We also uploaded the entire fundamentals courses uh, to the YouTube channel, so you can also check it out uh, on YouTube if you want. Um, also, capturing some of the YouTube language, uh, hit the bell and subscribe. I think that's a thing. So uh, please do uh, and stay updated on the latest on Renderman. So we add training courses, we add show reels, we add some behind the scenes. Um, so this is going to be a great platform for us as well. And besides, we also uh, maintain our, our Instagram channels as well. So you can definitely reach out on social media if you want to. And let's talk a little bit about this page. A few of you, uh, or all of you maybe, uh, are familiar with this page if you want to buy Renderman or you want to try Renderman. So right now we're offering two solutions, um, buying a full license if you want to, but also trying the non-commercial Renderman. Um, I know there is um, there was some some complaint about XPU is not part of NCR, um, and yes, that's true, um, and we will clarify in, in a second. Um, but this page uh, will also be changed uh, in the next coming weeks, um, so we will add a complete new store to the Renderman website, which makes it even easier for you to buy Renderman, um, and it's not the traditional workflow where you have to get a quote and then we send you a license. So it's a little bit complicated. So we want to make it easy for you to, to get a license uh, in an easy way. So that's coming online soon. And if you subscribe to a newsletter, uh, we will update you when the store is online. Uh, about NCR, there's one big change that's coming to NCR that we happy to announce today. And that's XPU for NCR. Um, but there is an asterisk. Um, so there's some legal constraints that we also have to follow. And therefore, we will only allow XPU being in NCR for 30 days. Um, and it will be released uh, in the very near future. And uh, hopefully, you can all try and check it out for uh, the upcoming art challenge. Um, but even beyond that, so if XPU is not available in NCR anymore after a period of time, you all have a chance to uh, request an evaluation license uh, with a full feature set, meaning XPU and also stylized looks if you want to. Um, so again, subscribe to the newsletter. We will uh, keep you updated once this is available and then go grab it and, and try it out. So with that, uh, I'm happy to hand it over to Steve May, Pixar's CTO, to also talk about the bigger picture and future of Renderman. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ollie. Um, as Ollie was going through the history of RenderMan, it made me realize that I've been, I started using RenderMan in 1991, which is 30 years ago. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, but um, anyway, it is what it is. Uh, we have a great lineup for the Art and Science Fair. Uh, attend as many sessions as you can. I encourage you to do that. You won't be disappointed. 
As Ollie said, my name is uh, Steve May. I am the Chief Technology Officer at Pixar. Uh, before I was CTO, I was a supervisor on a, on a few of our, our uh, earlier films like Monsters, Inc. and Finding Nemo, Cars, Up and Brave, a few, a few of those uh, movies. Um, but I'd like to talk to you today about our, what our overall technology strategy is at Pixar and, and how, how RenderMan, this is all about RenderMan, how RenderMan fits into that. Um, if you've hung around Pixar folks, you've probably heard this phrase, art challenges technology and technology inspires art. And we believe there is this very, very cool yin and yang between art and science that's extremely powerful. It was instilled in our founders and it continues to this day. And that's why technology itself is a cornerstone of our movie studio and why it's core to our culture and our, our filmmaking. So I was kind of point, pointing out Pixar has a long, long legacy of pioneering work in computer graphics. So if it was compositing or subdivision surfaces, particle systems, uh, many areas of rendering, including uh, motion blur, the raise algorithm, and of course, uh, uh, render man. Uh, and I feel like, you know, we've shown that magical things can happen when art and technology happen in the same place. And obviously it's not just the things. It's not just art and technology, it's, it's the people. And if you, um, if you go to Pixar, you'll see, you'll see that we take to the point where our space, our, and this is a picture of the atrium, uh, the main building of Pixar. Um, our space is specifically designed to encourage interaction between artists and technologists. And I think you know, this is what makes RenderMan special as a commercial renderer. RenderMan is built, is built here in that atrium in the buildings at Pixar in the crucible of production by, by engineers collaborating directly with artists every single day. Another thing I feel that makes RenderMan really special is that Disney has a very special technology ecosystem, I would call it. Uh, we have a group of independent studios that collaborate and freely share technology. So we've got Pixar, Walt Disney Animation Studios, Industrial Light and Magic, uh, and Disney Research, not to mention other studios like Marvel and, and Disney's Live Action. All of these studios contribute, test, and feed into the technology behind RenderMan. And that's super powerful and super cool. Uh, a recent example of this uh, that Dylan mentioned uh, is the Llama system from, from ILM. Their layered material technology is a key feature of RenderMan 24. And the reason it's in RenderMan 24 is because, again, we have these independent studios that freely share their innovations. At Pixar, I've asked our tech teams to focus on, on two, two key things, just trying to distill it down to the most simple things possible. One is artists working in parallel, and two is interactivity. So we want many artists to work on the same shots, the same assets at the same time. And because this is really important, this allows us to break down the walls between departments. Traditionally in animation, and this comes from the days of 2D hand-drawn animation, we kind of had this this horizontal pipeline of work going down from artist to artist, but they were kind of walled off from each other. Uh, we, we want to have that kind of broken down and we want maximum interactivity. So obviously we want fast feedback for the artists so they can iterate quickly, but also so they can work more closely with each other. And I feel like if we do these things, if we focus on working in parallel and interactivity, and I think I might've, if we do these things, focus on working in parallel and interactivity, we'll be able to achieve more context, more collaboration, and more creativity. Um, to achieve these goals, this is the slide I meant to be on, we built uh, at Pixar three core, core technologies. The first is USD, uh, then Presto, and, and RenderMan. And when I talk about RenderMan, I specifically mean our latest efforts with XPU. Um, USD, probably most people are familiar with this now. It's, it's how we describe scene data. Uh, as a set of layers that are composited together non-destructively. It's, it's very powerful. It allows many artists to work at the same time on very complex scenes. Presto, Presto is our, is our animation system. USD is the heart and soul of Presto. And RenderMan XPU, it leverages whatever hardware you have to interactively render feature film quality images. The combination of USD, Presto, and XPU creates the backbone for something I would call uh, universal rendering. Uh, we have to change the way we think about rendering. We used to think of rendering as something that happens at the end of the pipeline, kind of at the end of the animation process as an off offline or batch sort of thing that happens. 
Uh, that's not good enough anymore. I think a lot of you know that. Rendering needs to work throughout the pipeline in all applications. It needs to be universal. And it's not good enough if that renders a preview or an approximation of what the final render, final render will be. It needs to be the final render and it needs to be, it needs to be interactive. Who's that missing slide? So RenderMan XPU is, is the key. Um, and this is a hard problem. Uh, we can't take shortcuts. Uh, we need feature film fidelity quality. We need to be interactive. We don't want limits on geometric complexity or the number of lights. We don't want to require baking or maps or producing multiple passes. In the end, we're trying to make life easier for the artists so they can focus on being creative, not worry about technical details. Now you might be saying, hey, you mentioned USD, XPU and Presto. That's, that's great for Pixar, what about me? What if I don't have Presto? Well, I'm, I'm happy to say that Houdini uh, Solaris uh, and Maya 2022 have some wonderful workflows using USD and XPU. Uh, Dylan showed a little bit of that already. So, you know, just looking ahead, uh, I'm incredibly excited about the future. Um, allowing our artists to work interactively and in parallel will allow them to be more creative. Uh, RenderMan is one of the core technologies for achieving this for us. With USD and RenderMan XPU, we have universal rendering. And this will dramatically change the way our artists work and collaborate. So that ends my talk. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our last speaker. And trust me, you do not want to miss this. Uh, from side effects, the undisputed king of stupid render man tricks, Rob PK. Oh, hey everybody. You know, there's nothing I like more to relax at the end of the day than polishing one of my RenderMan teapots, like this beauty. Oh, shit! But my second favorite thing to do to relax is to use RenderMan for silly and fun things. So let's talk about text generation using path tracing. I'm going to start by talking about uh, BRDFs, which basically describe what happens as a stream of photons hits the surface. Uh, where do they go? If the surface is a perfect mirror, then they're going to reflect back out into space. Kind of angle of incidence, angle of reflection. Think back to the, all those fun high school physics classes you took. Now, there are very few perfect mirrors in the real world, but maybe your surface is a kind of a glossy one. Maybe it's like a tabletop or something like that. So again, most of the photons generally reflect, uh, but it's not a perfect reflection. There's a bit of variation. Some go slightly to the left, some go slightly to the right. And effectively, what we're drawing with this picture here is a statistical distribution of what happens as we bombard the surface with more and more and more photons. If it's a perfectly diffuse surface, say kind of like a, a matte piece of paper or a moon or something like that, then the photons basically just go everywhere. So let's move on to Markov chains now. And these are a way to describe uh, or predict maybe what's going to happen in the future given what just happened now or happened just in the past. So let's imagine that every day you have two choices. You can either go to the gym or not. And for you, um, you might say that every day that I go to the gym, there's a 50% chance that I'm gonna to go to the gym again tomorrow and a 50% chance that, you know what, I'm just gonna take the day off tomorrow. And correspondingly, if you take the day off today, you might say there's only a 10% chance that you're gonna to take tomorrow off as well and a 90% chance that you're gonna to go to the gym tomorrow. Uh, you don't wanna take two days off in a row. And so with this kind of complete picture of state changes and probability of moving between these two states, we can traverse the graph and come up with a plausible week. Uh, so maybe you go to the gym, you stay at home, go to the gym twice, stay at home, go to the gym, and then stay at home again. That feels plausible. That kind of matches the probability distribution uh, that we just outlined on this graph. But one of the more fun things that you can do with Markov chains is text generation. So imagine that our starting point is this state, the letter Q, and we'll just kind of make a note of that here in the top left. If we think about the statistics of the English language, 100% of the time, if you're not a complete Scrabble nerd, uh, Q is followed by the letter U. So now we can move to the U state, uh, and U can be followed by lots of different letters. Pretty much all the letters in the alphabet um, can follow U in a, in a real word. And here are kind of just the top four. So S, N, R, and T are the four most common letters that happen to follow the letter U. 
And we can pick one of these at random, and by random I do mean kind of a weighted randomness. So we'll pick the letter uh, S, and now we'll add that to our state. Uh, or to our history, I should say. And now we're in the S state. And similarly, S can be followed by lots of different letters, and here are the, the top four. Um, predominantly, S is followed by kind of an end of word marker, which, which makes sense that about half the words in the English language are going to be plural words, so they're going to end in S. Uh, interestingly, you can see that S is often followed by itself as well, which again, if you think about kind of various words, like guess, for example, has two S's in it. Uh, so we pick one of these again at random, and we'll pick the end of the word marker. So here's been our synthesized word. Um, cus, quas, pronounce it as you see fit. And you can do this just kind of again and again and again, picking different letters as your starting point, and kind of walking the uh, transitions between these different states, uh, using the statistics of the English language, and generate words like these. And they look semi-plausible. They're maybe a little bit long in some cases, and this very last one here has got a bit of an awkward starting with an SNT in it. So what we can do is actually enrich our state a little bit and consider not just uh, a single letter, but kind of a pair of letters. So we'll have sort of a, a start of word marker and the letter Q. And we'll just take note of the Q part of it. And again, Q is followed by a U. So kind of start of word Q goes to Q U 100% of the time. Again. Scrabble nerd stuff. Now, whereas U could be followed by pretty much any letter in the alphabet, QU is always followed by a vowel, either UA, UE, UI, or UO. So we'll pick one of those, we'll do UI, which brings us to this UI state. Uh, and again, some different letters that we can choose from. We'll choose N, uh, which brings us to Quinn. And then you can see that statistically, NG is the most common transition, which makes sense. IN goes to ING, so we'll choose that one. And then predominantly, we're at the end of the word. So our word now is quing. Uh, and here are some of the words that would be generated using this method. So using kind of two letters to uh, track our state. And they look slightly more plausibly English than the, the first set. Um, you at least have a kind of a healthy distribution of uh, consonants and uh, vowels. But let's go back to this diagram for a second here. We talked about transitioning from the QU state to one of these other four states. A different way that we could draw this diagram is this way here. Uh, so we're saying that we're in the QU state, and we can go to one of these AEIO states uh, with different probabilities. And we can actually split up our current state a little bit as well to say that we're in the U state and we came from the Q state. But this looks suspiciously like the BRDF diagram that I showed earlier in this talk. So let's go and actually write a BRDF uh, for RenderMan that does text generation. Now, a BRDF plugin for RenderMan has to answer three questions. What direction are we going to send our reflection ray? How reflective is the surface? And how emissive is the surface? Uh, we've already kind of seen that we know what direction to fire our rays. If we're, our, if we're on the U surface and we've got an incoming ray from Q, we want to fire things in the A, E, I, or O direction. But what exactly does that mean? So here we've got a scene um, where we've got the entire alphabet kind of represented twice. Uh, so it's from A, B, C, all the way around here to A, B, C again. And what's interesting or useful about this is that each of these disks can see all the other disks. Um, I'll make it a little bit easier that we really only have to see half the disks. So C can see C, um, B, A, Z, Y, X, so on and so forth, down the alphabet, and then up the alphabet, D, E, F, G. So this allows us to fire rays from any state or any letter to any other letter. And correspondingly to know where the rays came from just by measuring the angle uh, compared to the normal at which the incoming ray hits. Now the last two things are how reflective is the surface and how emissive is the surface. If we think about the integrators in RenderMan, this is basically how the final color is determined. The surface is going to emit some color uh, and is going to reflect a certain amount of the kind of continuation ray. But that continuation ray is then going to hit another surface, which is then going to spawn another ray, which is going to hit another surface, and so on and so forth. But eventually one of these rays is either going to terminate due to Russian roulette or it just doesn't hit anything. And at some point we do end up with kind of a closed form equation that we can actually solve. Now let's compare this with how we might encode a word. Uh, let's say the word cat. And we're going to encode this in base 27. Uh, 26 for the different 26 letters of the alphabet, and then one other letter, or pseudo letter, I should say, for kind of the end of word or start of word marker. So this is how in base 27 we might encode the word cat. And we can just kind of rework that algorithm or that equation a little bit to look like this. And now suddenly the top and bottom equations look exactly the same, or they have the same type of form. 
So our emission is going to be the letter that we want, and our reflectivity is always going to be 27. Uh, so whereas lots of shader writers focus very hard on making sure that their materials are energy conserving, they never reflect more light than it comes on upon the surface, here we have a surface that is 27 times more reflective than the light that comes in on it. The last thing in the scene is this camera here hidden behind a disc. Um, I said before this was A, B, C. Uh, so this is where the rendering is going to start. But let's figure out what RenderMan thinks the, uh, let's say the F word is. So let's switch that from C to D, E, F. And then we'll just quickly go back to Solaris and have a look through the render cam. So here's that super bright white image that we're expecting. We'll take a snapshot of that so we can figure out exactly what the color is. So 257, 100. Okay, so 257, 100 is Fram. The F word is Fram. Why not? And just for fun, let's also go and quickly check out what the S word is. So that is the 19th letter of the alphabet. Let that render. Now, rather than trying to figure out the math ourselves, uh, we can let RenderMan do that for us. Uh, we can just write a little display filter. So rather than looking at the color, we can look at the decoded. There it is, STIP. So finally, that brings us to IEEE 754, aka the floating point arithmetic standard. And it also brings us to the question of why so far we've only been talking about four letter words, other than the obvious that they're a lot of fun, very colorful. Uh, ultimately, the problem is one of precision. Uh, we've been encoding our words using base 27, uh, which means we start to generate some pretty big integers. And unfortunately, there's a limit with single point floating precision, the floating point used in RenderMan and pretty much every renderer's colors. We can only represent about 16.7 million different values. And if we do base 27 log of that, we've got a maximum of five characters to work with four characters for our four letter words and one left over for uh, kind of our end of word marker. So four letter words is all we can get. And I guess that kind of is the end of my talk. I hope you all enjoyed and to everyone out there, please stay safe. Thanks. All right. That's our Rainy Man Art and Science Fair. I think everybody's coming back on stage. Um, I know my mind is a, a little blown by uh, what Rob PK just said, but um, I guess uh, that's what happens when you mess with Fram. And thanks everybody, great, great talks. I hope you didn't have too much fun. <laughs>